Okay, today we're going to talk about the concept of the synapse. We're going to introduce the, the basic idea behind the synapse and a little bit about its origins. And uh, in the next video, we're going to talk more specifically about the chemical events that occur at the synapse. And a synapse is just a special point of communication between two neurons. Uh, and in general, that communication occurs by way of chemicals, so it can be electrical as well. These points of communication are called synapses. The, the term and a lot of what we know about synapses was first proposed by Charles Sherrington, a very uh, important uh, neuroscientist in the early part of the 20th century. In 1906, he described these specialized gaps that existed between neurons. So some terms we need to understand. The presynaptic neuron is the term that we use for the neuron that's delivering the synaptic transmission, the one that's sending the message to another neuron. The postsynaptic neuron is the one that's receiving the message. So if we look at this diagram over here, this is the transmitting neuron, or the presynaptic neuron, and this is the postsynaptic neuron, the one receiving the message. So with regard to, let's say, these synapses here, these points of communication, this one comes before, and this one comes after in terms of the direction of information flow. So this is the presynaptic before the synapse, and this is postsynaptic after the synapse. If we zoom in on the synapse, you might see something like this. So this is the axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron, this one here, or the terminal button. You can see it contains these synapses. Synapses are essentially little bubbles of cell membrane inside the cell that contain neurotransmitters, shown in red here, these neurotransmitter molecules. The neurotransmitters are chemicals used by one neuron to communicate with another. The vast majority of synaptic communication between neurons in your brain occurs using chemicals called neurotransmitters. They're contained inside these synaptic vesicles, vesicles, and when the action potential comes down the axon, it causes these synaptic vesicles to release their contents into the synaptic cleft, the gap, tiny gap, in between the presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons, shown here. They diffuse across in a tiny fraction of a second, and they bind to receptor sites on the postsynaptic cell, the one receiving the message, shown here. Now, the receptor sites are actually proteins. They're specialized protein molecules embedded in the membrane of the postsynaptic cell. They're not just little divots in the membrane, as shown here. Uh, we'll see more figures of those later. At any rate, those neurotransmitters bind to those receptor sites here, and they cause changes in the postsynaptic cell, usually exciting it or inhibiting it. We'll talk more about excitation inhibition in a minute. So these uh, postsynaptic potentials are graded potentials. The postsynaptic potentials are changes in voltage. Whenever you hear the word potential, think voltage change uh, a post or a difference in charge. A postsynaptic potential is one that occurs in the postsynaptic cell, the one receiving the message. These are graded potentials. In other words, they're not all or none, like the action potential. They can vary in size, just like your grades can be high or low. These are graded potentials that can be big or small. Also, unlike the action, action potential, they, it, they can go in two different directions. They can either be a depolarization, bringing up the membrane potential toward the threshold of excitation, which gives you an action potential, or the postsynaptic poten potential can be a hyperpolarization. This is inhibition. This takes the membrane potential further from zero. It hyperpolarizes the cell and pushes it further from the threshold and makes action potentials less likely. We have names for these excitatory and inhibitory signals. So when the postsynaptic potential, the voltage change that occurs in the neuron that's receiving the signal, is excitatory, we call it an EPSP, an excitatory postsynaptic potential. One way this often occurs is by opening sodium 
sodium channels that let sodium ions into the cell. In other words, the neurotransmitter binds to a special protein that lets sodium into the cell, depolarizing it. These are positive, so it brings the membrane potential closer to zero and brings it closer to the threshold of excitation. Now, importantly, these are not action potentials themselves. Again, they're graded potentials. They can be big or they can be small, but these are graded potentials that uh, bring the membrane potential, the, ins the voltage inside the neuron, closer to the threshold of excitation by depolarizing it. The magnitude of these also decreases along the membrane, uh, as we'll see in a little bit, and which is also unlike the action potential, which does not change in its amplitude as it moves down the axon. And then you also have inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, or IPSPs. These are temporary hyperpolarizations of the postsynaptic cell. So when the postsynaptic cell gets a message that makes it less likely to have an action potential, it becomes hyperpolarized. The voltage inside the cell becomes more negative, pushing the membrane potential away from the, uh, the threshold. This can occur by opening up potassium channels. So the neurotransmitter can open up potassium channels and cause potassium to leave the cell. Or it can open chloride channels. Chloride is highly concentrated outside the cell. And as you can see, it's a negative ion. So when you open up chloride channels, it lets chloride enter the cell, making the inside of the cell more negative. Let me show you this in graphical form. So imagine this is your postsynaptic cell here, and imagine we're recording right here at the axon hillock. Here's the axon. In this case, we've got a couple of excitatory presynaptic neurons here. So these are going to tend to increase the likelihood of action potentials in the postsynaptic cell. And here we have an inhibitory presynaptic input. So in other words, when an action potential comes down this axon here, let's say, this neuron releases a neurotransmitter that depolarizes the postsynaptic cell. That neurotransmitter binds to proteins right in embedded in the membrane here. Let's say letting in sodium ions. The sodium ions are positive, which depolarizes the cell, brings its membrane potential closer to zero, like this. So imagine this is the, uh, the voltage being graphed out that you're recording from inside the neuron, let's say right here. So here is your EPSP, your excitatory postsynaptic potential. You can see that the membrane has gotten closer to zero and closer to the threshold of excitation. In this case, shown as negative 50 millivolts. When the inhibitory, postsynap when the inhibitory neuron uh, has an action potential, the action potential travels down the axon, reaching the, uh, the terminal button here synaptic terminal, and it causes the release of a neurotransmitter, a chemical, that binds to receptors on the postsynaptic cell, which decreases the voltage, makes it more negative, as shown here. So here's an IPSP, or inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Notice in both these cases, the voltage returns to the resting potential afterwards. It's a temporary depolarization, or in this case, hyperpolarization. Okay, uh, you can also see here that when you have more than one EPSP in a row, that they can add together. So that's what's being shown here. So let's imagine that this presynaptic neuron here, this excitatory one, that tends to depolarize the postsynaptic cell. Let's imagine that instead of having just one action potential come down, that two in a row come down this axon in quick succession. Boom, boom. Now, if they come in rapid enough succession, you can see that the second EPSP, the second depolarization caused at the synapse, can add on to the first one. The first one hasn't resolved yet, and then the second one is adding on top of it. This is known as temporal summation. Temporal, temporal means other relating to time. So these EPSPs, these postsynaptic potentials, are adding together across time because they come in rapid succession.
In this case, you can see that one EPSP in this example isn't enough to get you to have an, to the threshold to have an action potential in this postsynaptic cell. Two in a row doesn't quite get you there, but we could imagine that three action potentials in a row coming down in rapid succession in, uh, in this axon here could add together. They could create a temporal summation that gets you to the threshold, triggers an action potential in this postsynaptic cell. Also, what's shown here is the idea of spatial summation. So let's say we have these two action, these two axons here. Let's say that neither one of them is sufficient to generate an action potential. So one action potential coming down this axon here, creating one EPSP here, is not enough to bring this postsynaptic cell to threshold to have an action potential. But you could imagine that the two of them together might be sufficient to depolarize the cell enough to reach threshold to cause an action potential. And that's what's shown here. So simultaneous or near simultaneous EPSPs from spatially distinct presynaptic inputs. So from two, three, or more different uh, presynaptic terminals. The EPSPs generated by these, these spatially distant ones, could add together to bring the postsynaptic cell's membrane up to threshold and generate an action potential. So temporal summation is when repeated stimuli within a brief period of time have a cumulative effect on the postsynaptic cell. So multiple inputs coming down a single axon within short, uh, a short period of time can exert a cumulative effect on the postsynaptic cell. Similarly, different inputs, different presynaptic inputs onto a postsynaptic cell can exert a cumulative effect when they occur at the same time. So several synaptic inputs coming from separate locations can exert a cumulative effect on the postsynaptic cell. This is known as spatial summation, adding or summing across space, as opposed to adding or summing across time. This is going to occur for a single axon, a single presynaptic input, with multiple action potentials over time. This is going to occur with multiple presynaptic inputs having simultaneous or near simultaneous input at the same time. This is just showing you the same thing again graphically. So here's your postsynaptic neuron that may or may not have an action potential. When several action potentials in a row come down this presynaptic axon, they exert a cumulative effect on the postsynaptic cell. That's called temporal summation. If you have an action potential coming down multiple axons, multiple presynaptic inputs, simultaneously or nearly simultaneously, they can also exert a cumulative effect, and this is called spatial summation, adding across space. Okay, so let's put these together. What's the relationship then between EPSPs, IPSPs, and action potentials? We've already talked about action potentials. These are those uh, signals that neurons use to encode information, and by now we understand that EPSPs and IPSPs are the voltage changes that are created in postsynaptic cells that, uh, that lead to an action potential or not. In reality, the probability of an action potential on any given neuron depends on the ratio of EPSPs to IPSPs at a given moment. In other words, at every moment, <clears throat> the postsynaptic neuron is sort of weighing the excitatory and the inhibitory input that it's receiving. The same neuron can be receiving an inhibitory and excitatory inputs at the same time or in close succession. And if the ex excitation outweighs the inhibition, then you're more likely to have an action potential. If the inhibition, the IPSPs, outweigh the excitation, the EPSPs, then you're less likely to have an action potential. But it gets a little more complicated. It turns out that most neurons have a spontaneous firing rate. In other words, if you were to take the neuron out of the network that it's in, out of the circuit, and 
put it in a petri dish and keep it alive by itself, it will often have action potentials. Without any kind of input whatsoever, it just tends to depolarize periodically enough to have an action potential. This is called the spontaneous firing rate. So in that case, EPSPs and IPSPs are really just increasing and decreasing the rate of action potentials, the firing rate of that neuron. One or several EPSPs in a row will tend to increase the likelihood of an action potential at that moment. One or several IPSPs in a row will tend to decrease the likelihood of having an action potential at that moment. And just as multiple EPSPs can add together, e multiple IPSPs can add together and create a, an even stronger inhibition. And multiple EPSPs and IPSPs can add together and tend to cancel each other out, such that an EPSP and an IPSP at the same time might have no effect whatsoever on the membrane potential of the postsynaptic cell. At the beginning of this presentation, I mentioned that Charles Sherrington proposed the idea of the synapse and gave us some of the most important ideas uh, associated with the synapse. Let's talk about that. So Charles Sherrington uh, investigated how neurons communicate with each other mainly by studying reflexes uh, and mainly doing it in animals. M reflexes are automatic muscular responses to stimuli. So for example, uh, pain or uh, the patellar tendon reflex when your physician hits you underneath the kneecap and your leg kicks out. These are uh, specifically spinal reflexes, but they're automatic responses that occur along a reflex arc. <clears throat> the reflex arc is the, the neural pathway from the sensation to the, the muscle itself. One example is the leg flexion reflex. Uh, this is a kind of nociceptive re reflex in response to pain where a sensory neuron excites an interneuron in the spinal cord, which then in turn excites a motor neuron, which carries that message out to the muscle, telling it to contract. A lot of Sherrington's work involved dogs and other animals. So for example, if you pinch the paw of a dog, uh, it will withdraw its foot, the foot of the, uh, the paw that's been pinched, and extend the other three paws. This is a spinal reflex. You can, I know it's sad, but you can uh, disconnect the spinal cord of a dog and suspend its body in a harness, and this response will still occur. So no brain connected, you pinch the paw, that paw retracts, the other three legs extend. This is a mechanism to prevent tissue damage in the foot uh, from occurring. So if it steps on something sharp, for example, uh, that paw lifts up, the other three legs can support its weight. We have a very similar reflex. So if you were to step on a, a nail or a tack or something or a piece of glass, uh, before your brain is even completely aware of that pain, the signal has traveled up your leg into the spinal cord as an action potential. Remember that all signals in the nervous system are carried along neurons as action potentials. So the pain generates action potentials in the pain receptor, the nociceptor, which travels up into the spinal cord, enters in the dorsal part of the spinal cord here, and you can see branches off. It communicates by way of a synapse with a neuron or neurons that relay that message up to the brain. But importantly, within the spinal cord itself, it makes synapses in this case with four inner neurons in this little diagram. Some of these inner neurons make synapses with other excitatory neurons, shown in red. But in a couple of cases, shown in black, you've got inhibitory neurons. So in other words, this neuron excites this one, which inhibits this one, which then inhibits this muscle. So let's think about what's, what happens here. You step on this tack, this, the action potential comes in, you end up inhibiting this muscle and contracting this one. This flexes your leg and moves the foot away from the painful stimulus from the tack. These signals also cross over the midline to the other side of the spinal cord where they do the opposite. In this case, they're inhibiting the extensor, I'm sorry, the flexor muscle and exciting 
the extensor muscle. So the left leg is uh, going to be extended, pressing it into the ground, while the right leg is contracting and pulling it away. Sherrington studied these reflexes and inferred some amazing things about, uh, about synapses, pretty much everything we've learned already. First, he found that reflexes are slower than conduction along an axon. He showed that several weak stimuli presented at slightly different times or slightly different locations produce a stronger reflex than a single one. In other words, he foreshadowed temporal and spatial summation. And he also found that as one set of muscles becomes excited, another set of muscles relaxes. This was evidence for inhibitory signals, inhibitory synapses, which uh, hadn't been really considered before Sherrington's time. So let's talk about that difference in the speed of conduction uh, through synapses. Sherrington found a difference in the speed of conduction in a reflex arc from previously measured action potentials. And he, he thought that this difference, this slowing through the reflex arc, must be accounted for by the time it took for communication between neurons. And this was evidence of the idea that there are synapses interposed between neurons and that these take extra time to allow conduction. So for example, the speed of conduction along an axon can vary greatly, but in general it's about 40 meters per second. So from here to here, the action potential is traveling about 40 meters per second. But Sherrington measured the time it took from when he would uh, pinch the dog's foot to when the muscle would contract, measured the distance of the reflex arc from the pain receptor up through the spinal cord and down to the muscle, and the time it took for that signal to travel was much less than 40 meters per second. And that's because there were synapses interposed along the pathway. And the action potent the, the transmission of the signals in those synapses, which much, was much slower than the axon just traveling along, I'm sorry, the action potential traveling along an axon. The speed of conduction through a reflex arc was more like 15 meters per second. And Sherrington inferred correctly that the delay occurred at the synapses. He also observed temporal summation. So he observed that by pinching the dog's foot a couple of times in quick succession, very quick succession, he could get a, a stronger response, a stronger withdrawal reflex of that foot. So this is the idea of temporal or overtime summation. Again, repeated stimuli can have a cumulative effect and can produce a nerve impulse or action potential when a single stimulus is too weak to do so. He also observed spatial summation. So he noticed that several small pinches or several small stimuli in similar locations, but not, not in the exact same location. So he was pinching in a way that it would have created uh, a pain response in multiple nociceptors, multiple pain receptors in the dog's foot, the same foot, at the same time. When he did this, he could produce uh, a withdrawal reflex even though a single pinch wasn't enough to do it. So he would pinch it just enough that it, uh, the dog wouldn't withdraw its foot, but two similar pinches, neither of which alone was enough to produce the withdrawal reflex. When he did them together, the dog would withdraw its foot. This was evidence of spatial summation. Again, uh, the, the dog's spinal cord had been severed in the neck, so it was essentially a quadriplegic, and this was still occurring. So it's not the, like the dog was thinking about this. This is happening in a reflexive way uh, in the spinal cord. So again, synaptic input from several locations can have a cumulative effect and trigger a nerve impulse or action potential. So you could imagine that this neuron here, from the figure we saw earlier, is a spinal cord neuron, a motor neuron in the dog's spinal cord that relays a message to the muscles that cause the, uh, the dog's muscles to contract. You can imagine this is a pain signal coming in. Uh, if you were to pinch the dog's foot several times, you have more action potentials coming in in quick succession creating a more vigorous withdrawal reflex. 
Likewise, if you pinch the dog's foot in several places, you could imagine these three axons coming in from different pain receptors. One action potential down any one of them might be in, not be enough to trigger an action potential here and cause uh, the, the muscle to contract and the leg to withdraw. But an action potential down all three at about the same time might be enough to get you to threshold and cause an action potential here. Finally, Sherrington noticed that during the reflex, the leg of the dog that was pinched retracted while the other three legs were extended. He inferred, again correctly, that there's an interneuron in the spinal cord. Small neurons interposed in between the sensory and the motor neurons that sent an excitatory message to the flexor muscles of one leg, but sent inhibitory muscles to, or I'm sorry, inhibitory messages to the muscles in other legs. Here's the bottom line. Synapses are how all our neurons communicate with one another. As I'm speaking to you, as you're understanding my speech, uh, as you're learning, what's happening is that there are patterns of action potentials across the hundred or billion or so neurons in your brain. And those action potentials are being created or inhibited by synapses. Those hundred billion or so neurons are strung together in complex circuits, some of them exciting others, some of them inhibiting others. When you wire them all together using synapses, you end up with a brain that allows you to think and act and feel the way that you do.